Dr. Alana Wisby. I'm a deep tech entrepreneur and the CEO of Oxford Quantum Circuits. So there's more and more data in the world. This is a start point we know, and, and the computers that we have today are fundamentally limited in terms of their performance and what they can do. And there's multiple different ways and examples of which you know that's the case. Um, they all tend to be quite specific. So um, you know, two examples: one one around molecules and anything to do with molecular simulation, um, and the other more to do with kind of data and optimization. Um, if we think about the caffeine molecule, it's got 95 electrons. If we were to try to simulate that with any given accuracy with the computers today, you would need, I think, 10 to the 48, or like, there's got a special number, it's like a quindecimal or something, um, but a ridiculous amount of memory that is equivalent to the tenth the size of the number of atoms in the Earth, um, which you could do, um, but would take a really, really long time. <laughs> For a lot of space, <laughs> um, and actually, a quantum computer could simulate that accurately with around 100 to 160 qubits. Um, so that's that's one way. Um, the other is through optimization. So if you start to think about the traveling salesperson problem, if you want to travel to multiple different cities at a time, taking the shortest path. Um, if you do, sorry, I've got numbers to hand. I might just have to look. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I don't have this one off the top that's of my right. head. Um, if you were to travel through 16 cities, that's currently okay, but we would use probably a supercomputer for that today. Um, it's around 10 to the 14 or 1,000 seconds, or 10 to 14 pieces of memory. Uh, if you start to then increase that to 22 cities, this very quickly becomes quite challenging. Um, you're now thinking about 1,600 years. <laughs> in terms of processing power, or 28 cities um, is longer than the universe has ever existed. So these are specific examples of problems where regular computers that we have today aren't necessarily optimised or, or going to fundamentally be able to work and address those specific types of challenges. And many of those challenges um, tie really well into you know the topic we're talking about today of sustainability, um, particularly when it comes to thinking about materials discovery um, and optimizing for efficiency. Yes, of course, this is very topical. Um, I think we're all aware of, of the underlying um, challenges that come with with. Bitcoin mining, I think even just getting a graphics card right now is like insanely expensive and pretty much impossible um, because of that and the, and the power that's going to be associated with it. So there is also an angle, of course, of rather than having a computer on for a thousand years, it's going to be more <laughs> efficient to have it on for a shorter period of time and utilize quantum computation in that way. The things that immediately come to mind are more focused on the molecular discovery side. So starting to think about batteries, new battery technologies, how we can start to find new, more efficient and effective materials for creating stuff for infrastructure. So concrete, for example, we know is incredibly carbon intensive. Um, so finding new ways to create more, more friendly, world friendly materials, I think is, is one element um, of it. The other examples that, that are quite often tied to are fertilizer solutions. Um, this is probably one you've been talked through a number of times, but uh, there's a specific molecule. Uh, so when you create fertilizer, there's a nitrogen fixation process, um, and there's a specific molecule that exists um, in the grass outside. Um, and for that process, it, it does this nitrogen fixation process at room temperature or whatever temperature it is outside. Um, and that's how Mother Nature operates. But with uh, man-made fertilizers, we have to have incredibly high pressures, high temperatures, in order to stimulate that same process to create the fertilizers that we have today. And that actually uses up around 2% of the world's energy, which is just completely mind-blowing. And it's like, I'm gonna say this is happening outside <laughs> as we speak, um, but it's, a, it's another example of where we just don't understand the world around us effectively and where quantum computing can really help um, because we can start to simulate those molecules. We can start to do that accurately, effectively, and on a really short, shorter time period. Um, 
this will lead to more innovation. Um, but these, these are examples that come to mind immediately. Uh, once we have the quantum computer at a point where you can start to do more R&D, more discovery on it, uh, we will start to see even more applications, right? If you think about all of these different types of industries that use materials, um, you know, even if, even if within aeroplanes, um, we could start to have better aerodynamics by being able to produce more um, efficient and effective um, materials there. That would be incredibly powerful. Sure, so uh, a quantum computer works off quantum mechanics. Um, that's its core, it's fundamentally different to any kind of standard classical computer in that way. Um, it's built up of, of qubits that exploit the properties of quantum mechanics, um, the key three things there um, being superposition, entanglement, um, but it's also like the uncertainty principle um, and the fact that it's inherently quantum, of course, as well. Um, once you combine all of these things together, you can create quantum bits, qubits, um, and qubits don't operate just with a binary one or a zero. They suddenly open up an entirely new state space, um, which means that you're no longer limited um, to just that one or that zero. So for every qubit you add, you add a factor, you add a power, which means that you can start to do a ton more information processing in a lot shorter period of time. Um, there's also an element where it's like it's inherently quantum, so I think this is particularly why certain applications such as quantum molecular um, simulation leans in, because you can start to simulate quantum with quantum in ways which you can't otherwise with the computers today. It's an incredibly exciting time for the industry as a whole. So um, if you start to think about a number of different things that we need to do to achieve quantum computing that's useful, like it can impact, can start to solve some of the problems that we're here talking about today, um, there are a number of things we need. We need bigger systems, so we need to be able to scale them. We need to have high quality qubits across you know, the full scale of the system. So in tech terms, that's high coherence, high fidelity and low error rates. Um, so that's the scale, quality, and we also need to be able to build the infrastructure to control all of those um, qubits. Now, actually achieving all of those three things in tandem together is currently quite challenging, um, but the industry is making fantastic progress. And we're currently at this kind of turning point that's really exciting, um, whereby we're entering into what's, what's sometimes known as the NISC era. But basically it's early, quantum computation with early applications. Um, and they are going to be more limited than full-scale, fault-tolerant, error-corrected quantum computation that we expect in around you know, 10 years' time. But being able to start to have quantum computers make an impact to industries, to commercial customers, on societal impact today is, is really exciting. And we're, we're just moving into that point where these things are genuinely becoming um, being brought through to fruition. Again, here, thinking about quantum simulation of molecules. Um, so these problems map incredibly neatly onto some of these early stage quantum computers. And even if you can break that problem down into a, a smaller subset, that can give you insights that would still provide tremendous benefit, even if it's not necessarily solving kind of the full molecular um, problem. That's where we would start to see most likely these early early applications through these different types of you know VQE variation eigensolver type problems. Um, and, and you know kind of linking that through to application, you know, being able to simulate small scale materials for battery technologies, um, being able to start some small scale optimization problems for better routing. Um, there are many examples of where companies are already looking at what they can do, even if it's not going to solve the full problem, to start solving a subset um, of that today. I think, first of all, it's worth saying, I hope that sustainability is at the forefront of, of pretty much everybody's mind, no matter what industry or what sector that you're working in. Um, and we see that with, with the UK government and the initiatives around, you know, more broadly from governments with sustainability development um, goals. Uh, and the UK, of course, hosting COP26 in November, which is very exciting. 
and quantum is no exception, right? It's, it's, it's no exception to that. So all of the things that apply to pretty much every industry standardly today will also apply um, to the growing quantum computing um, industry and ecosystem. But there are things that are going to be unique and are going to be specific, um, and they probably vary depending on what technology even you're working with. At Oxford Quantum Circuits, we work with superconducting technology. So that means that we have cryostats um, to cool our quantum devices down to temperatures that's colder than space. Believe it or not, that takes power, and it takes quite a lot of power, and it also takes cryogenics. Um, and cryogenics are also things that are carbon and very high, very high um, in their carbon consumption in, in terms of development. Um, so these are problems that are going to be more specific um, to the R&D, to the development process. Um, and there are a number of things and a number of ways that we can start to think about how we address that just simply standard improvements to operations and maintenance, making sure that every single time one of those systems is cold, it's being best and most effectively utilized to its full capacity so that we can both accelerate the R&D, but also you know, decrease the load and the impact of that cool down um, on, on the environment itself. By also building larger and larger systems, um, and by that I mean the quantum processes themselves, the interesting thing with this is that actually it doesn't scale necessarily, you know, proportionally. Um, so each time you might need to go up in terms of the size of the system or the size of the cooling power, um, then that's going to be a trigger point. But until that point, the load and the cost effectiveness is, is basically the same. So um, you can start to get more kind of bang for your buck in terms of uh, what capability you can can do and the type of applications you can run um, without necessarily needing to increase the, the environmental load each time. So we're starting by measuring our carbon emissions. Um, of course, we have a lab downstairs which has got multiple of these systems. We're also an operating company, um, so there are carbon emissions associated with each of that. So starting by tracking that, that's one of the KPIs um, that we track within the company. Um, and then our second goal here is to now offset those carbon emissions so that we can become a carbon neutral quantum computing company. Our goal internally is to be carbon neutral by the end of 2022. Um, and that's something we're very proud to be committed to. The scale, the scale is, is, is large, right? And we are not going to be able to solve the problems of the future with the technology necessarily of today. And I think this is where we are relying on the technology and we are relying on the science to be able to start to address and identify um, and, and, and not just kind of identify, but, but resolve um, these problems. And for me as a scientist and as an entrepreneur, that's, that's really exciting because we can start to, to you know, do all of the cool, incredible science, but with an impact and with an application that's going to be more than just based on business, but actually be able to provide societal impact um, and help build towards a more sustainable future. I am hopeful. Um, I think you have to remain hopeful. Um, as a, an entrepreneur, you have that, you know, can-do if attitude and approach and you know, we are absolutely determined to make sure that the technology we're building at, from a quantum computing perspective will, will have that positive impact. So individually and as a company, if we have a role to play in, in addressing that, then you know, with, uh, we, we all hope, we all hope to. So I can remain hopeful because we are playing an active part. Um, I think more broadly than quantum technology, um, we're seeing so much incredible innovation um, and the minds of today are really tuned into this stuff, um, way more than we've seen in, in, in previous generations. Um, so I have hope based on the tech, based on the people, based on the evolving culture and mindset. Um, so yes, I have hope. Thankfully, we're not at war but we are in the midst of a crisis. Um, and I think there are multiple elements of crisis, you know, with the pandemic, with the climate crisis, and wherever there is crisis, wherever there is adversity, be it 
war, be it pandemic or otherwise, there will always be opportunity and there will always be innovation. Um, and the focus of the population, um, I think this is, this is the, the key difference is we turn to technology at those times. We turn to, um, we turn to technology to, to help, help make sure these things never happen again. Um, and to mitigate against that. And there's more onus on governments. And I think this is one of the things we see in terms of mindset change is people aren't just looking to governments now, they're looking to science and they, they believe that governments and science should be interacting much more. And this is something we've seen a lot over the last year or two, um, where suddenly people are turning to science and they're really getting interested and they're questioning and it's the role of science, it's the role of innovation and technology to help deliver um, for the good of society, to work more closely with government and to help find the opportunity um, in the midst of challenge.